Today we're going to have an overview of removable partial dentures. Exactly what do you do from the very start to the finish of your RPD case? What you're looking at is the partially dentulous arch from an occlusal view of the maxillary. You start out with an examination of your patient. You will do all of the standard examinations required when working up a new patient, for example, a perio exam and, and a general uh, caries charting. These exams can take some time, so one important thing to remember is that you want to get your diagnostic impressions of the patient on the very first day. Here is the mandibular partially edentulous arch from an occlusal view. You will probably be restoring this arch with a removable partial denture or the patient will require some major bone augmentation if he has any thoughts about an implant restoration due to the very nature of those very thin sharp ridges. It appears that the patient has also a couple of new amalgam restorations on his right side. The patient's occlusion is a buccal view of the patient's left side. If you're a little confused, these are mirror images. Mouth mirrors are used to take these pictures. The view reveals that we may need to have occlusion rims in order to mount the case accurately for diagnosis. When you have two partially edentulous arches like this, you're required to have the case mounted for diagnosis and presentation at the treatment planning appointment. This shows the patient's occlusion, the buccal view on the patient's right side. Since you will need occlusion rims to mount this case, it is imperative that you get your diagnostic cast done immediately in order to save one appointment. If you do not get your cast on this first appointment, then you will have to do it the next time, and then the third appointment will be for getting a face bow, occlusion rims, records to mount the case, and for treatment planning on the fourth appointment. This is what I mean by the comment to make your diagnostic cast on the first appointment. It may save you an appointment or two uh, prior to treatment planning. You can see here that a student is making a diagnostic impression of the patient's maxillary arch. Remember, as prosthodontists, we're interested in all the anatomy, not just the teeth. And in this case of a maxillary arch, we want to see all the information back to and including the hamular notches. In this case, you can see a narrow palatal vault and the presence of a maxillary torus. Both of these items may affect our final design plans for the partial. Sometimes we have tuberosity interference and can see this only after the time we try to mount the case. Um, we have to have recorded all the proper anatomy in the impression, poured the cast properly, and then made sure not to trim off the cast, eliminating some of this vital anatomy that is necessary for proper diagnosis. You pour up the impressions using a gypsum product like Quickstone and create your diagnostic cast of the maxillary and mandibular arches. Be sure you don't over trim the cast. You should show the vestibular roll, the depth of that vestibule should show the turn, and then on the outside there should be about an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch land area present on the cast. Also be sure to index the cast. At the very first appointment, begin to fill out the RPD step card, which is a green card available around the dispensary area, which calls for a faculty signature at the time of diagnostic impressions. Remember, even if you don't get your other exams completed, get the diagnostic impressions because it may save you one appointment later down the road. At the time of impressions, it should have been determined whether to construct record bases and occlusion rims. If you cannot hand articulate the two casts accurately and or they cannot be adequately supported by each other during the mounting procedure, then record bases and occlusion rims will be needed to mount the case.
You are now ready to try in the occlusion rims and adjust them to the desired vertical dimension of occlusion. We don't necessarily want you to adjust them until the maxillary and the mandibular teeth or arches touch. The patient may be very overclosed. We want you to determine the distance between the nose and the chin where you want to construct your dentures. You will learn more about the procedure of determining vertical dimension of occlusion in the complete denture course that you take this fall. We're going to use the Whitmix articulator to mount the case for clinic. We also use the FACEBO registration that is a Whitmix FACEBO apparatus. It is very easy mechanism to use. The bite fork is prepared by placing red stick compound in a water bath at 140 degrees or by placing polyvinyl siloxane on the bite fork. We prefer the use of compound. The compound is then wrapped around the bite fork and you place a little bit of Vaseline on the teeth to lubricate them and you position the bite fork so that the midline of the bite fork aligns with the midline of the face and you support that bite fork until the material has set. You want to only record the cuss tips into the compound. If the indentations are too deep, they can that material being very stiff could actually break the cast when you try to reinsert it or you could break teeth upon insertion and removal. If the indentations are too deep, then go ahead and trim them down using the red handle uh, Bard Parker blade. The bite fork then is ready to reinsert into the mouth and the patient will hold it in position using her thumbs on the underside of the bite fork or if you have enough teeth on the lower to support it, you can place cotton rolls and have the patient occlude and hold the bite fork in position. You're now ready to continue to add the face bow apparatus. Now you're ready to assemble the face bow apparatus. You want to loosen the thumb screws on the face bow so that you may place the earpieces in the patient's ears. The screws are labeled A on the picture above. Next, have your patient place each earpiece in the external auditory meatus and hold them in place with a firm forward pressure. You may need the help of an assistant if the patient is having to support that bite fork in place because it must be kept firmly in place while you take this face bow record. The nasion piece, labeled B, is placed on that crossbar of the apparatus and left loose, meaning not touching the nasion for the time being. Tighten the three thumb, thumb screws, labeled A, on the two halves of the face bow apparatus. Now with the frame firmly in place and tightened, center the nose piece labeled D on the nasion. Now exert some firm pressure on the nose piece shaft while tightening the thumb screw labeled E on the nasion relator. You will attach the quick lock toggle assembly to the bite fork using the thumb screw labeled F. Note, you may find it easier to lock the toggle assembly to the bite fork by rotating the assembly so that the screws on the underneath side of the bite fork. This makes it easier for you to get your fingers in there. Lock it into place using that same thumb screw. Finally, lock the quick lock toggle assembly by turning the single thumb screw or a little bar located at the center of the toggle assembly. Make sure that the quick lock toggle assembly is firmly locked in place. The assembled face bow is now complete and the patient is shown on the lower right picture. Removable prosthodontics often uses the Hanau articulator. This is my preference because the condylar element is locked in place, which makes tooth setting easier and it has an adjustable incisal guide table for variable settings. We show here the Hanau apparatus called a spring bow, which is very easy to use. First, you insert part A, that vertical rod of the face bow part, and you put it into part B that goes around the face. You line up the knobs of part A of the apparatus facing you so that they are in the order of one, two, and three as you read them from left to right. 
That makes it easily obtainable to your fingers. If you can't line them up that way, then what you probably have is that you have part A upside down into part B. All the knobs should be loosened at this point. We will use red cake compound on the bite fork, and the cast alone or the cast with the occlusion rim um, is placed on the warm compound in a position where the midline is at that little brass dot that's shown on the face or on the bite fork above. Record only the cuss tips into the compound to avoid possible tooth fracture. The bite fork D is placed in the mouth, aligning it with the O-rim and the teeth. The bite fork in the mouth is inserted into that face bow apparatus, B and A, at point D, with the three knobs loosened. It is then inserted into the external auditory meatus. The third point of reference on the handout face bow is the metal pointer C, which is adjusted to the height of the infraorbital notch at the base of the orbit. Then the knobs are tightened, number one, first, two, and three. Be sure to support the member of the articulator that goes into the ears while tightening those screws or you can actually hurt the patient. The spring bow then is complete and may be removed. Decide whether a jaw registration record is to be taken in maximum intercuspation or in centric relation. If enough posterior teeth remain to allow the teeth to easily intercuspate, then I tend to use a maximum intercuspation position. If only anteriors remain and little posterior intercuspation exists, or if I have a complete denture over a removable partial denture, then I have to choose to use the jaw registration in centric relation with the condyles in the most superior anterior position of the glenoid fossa. Record the occlusion and prepare to mount the case. Make sure that your cast have indexes before mounting your case. This is imperative if you want the lab to adjust the occlusion after processing, and believe me, you do. They must be able to place the cast back on the articulator in the proper position and can only do this if indexes are present. After you record the jaw registration, you can mount the upper case with the face bow registration on a semi-adjustable articulator like the handout. Then mount the lower against the upper using the jaw registration record. A mounted case is the only way to get an accurate and complete diagnosis of the problems. The point of this slide is that diagnosis is the key to success, and as you can see uh, by the mounting of this case, you become aware of problems in the mouth that may not be evident without properly mounted cast. Some tough decisions have to be made. There's no room for tooth replacement in the edentulous area shown on the left patient. Do you leave well enough alone, or do you do major extractions and alveoloplasties on this patient? Which treatment gives the patient a better solution? A lot of analysis must go into your decision. Are there TMJ symptoms? Are teeth painful or have periodontal problems? Do they have periapical problems? Is the patient concerned about the missing posterior teeth for aesthetics or function? You may choose to do nothing on this patient. The right uh, patient reveals an occlusal plane problem on the mandibular. All of this not evident without a set of mounted cast. The next thing that you want to do is bring your patient, your radiographs, mounted case, and surveyed cast with a tentative design sheet that has your attempted design for a removable partial denture for this patient. We will do an RPD consult. We'll look at the patient, we're going to look at the cast, and all the information that you have and decide on a tentative design for an upper and or lower RPD. We will also decide which teeth constitute good abutments for an RPD and which teeth need either new restorations, such as a crown or just fillings. We will also get you started and hopefully finished on a treatment plan at this patient so that you can get moving with the treatment. This shows the surveyed diagnostic cast with marked undercuts. This is necessary for you to come up with an RPD design to place on that tentative design sheet. 
Patients must be scheduled for the RPD consult and treatment planning appointment. Think about the case and draw a tentative design on the design sheet for each arch that is going to have a removable partial denture. It's okay if you don't do it correctly, but what we want you to do is think about the case first and then we'll offer our opinion. The patient should be present at this particular appointment. When you complete this step, make certain that you get the signatures on the RPD step card. An orange card is used when the crowns in, or bridges are involved, and the green card is used when there is no crowns involved in the partial denture. Be sure to work out an approved treatment plan with your group or with the OHR clinic in case of treatment that is to be done in our clinic. You need to make sure that if implants are involved that you have some feedback as to what the treatment plan would be involved, for instance, in perio or oral surgery, so that you can incorporate it into one plan. Get the patient's oral rehabilitation completed prior to beginning your prostheses. That would probably include any restorative endoperio ortho oral surgery. Those are done in phase one. You'd also like to get your implants placed early in the game so that the patient can be integrating while you complete some of this work. Any real questionable teeth though, that work should be um, investigated with either like ENEs to determine whether a tooth is salvageable because that might determine a change in the design for implants and partial dentures. Extraction should be done at least uh, 10 weeks prior to the beginning of the RPD, 8 to 10 weeks. Now that depends on how much bone loss there is around the teeth. And two, though, if you have facings involved, you should get those teeth out at least for three months because you're apt to get a surprise when that bone shrinks under a delivered uh, RPD with facings. You'll have a nice black hole under it. Some examples of the type of work that must be completed prior to beginning your RPD are shown here. Any survey crowns need to be um, worked up in at the end of phase one. Um, wax patterns could be surveyed prior to casting the crowns if you're doing them yourself. Otherwise, the crowns need to be surveyed prior to cementation to check for undercuts and guide planes. Some final castings are shown in this slide, and they include a full gold crown, an inlay, and a porcelain to metal crown. When they are an abutment tooth and they are a survey crown, which means that the lab produces them to fit the requirements of the RPD, then they must be surveyed before you cement the teeth. That's to make sure that the undercuts are all present because it's easy to make adjustments on the teeth when they're not cemented into the mouth. After any corrections have been made to the finished castings or the case has been sent back to the laboratory and returned, one final check is done on the surveyor to make sure that they are suitable abutments. After you've done this, you may cement the crowns and then be sure to get the signatures on the orange card versus the green one. When all of phase one is complete and the fillings have been finished, the periodontal health has been achieved, any root canals, crowns, or extractions are complete and healing is ready to uh, proceed, you're ready to start your prosthesis. Um, remember, extractions need about eight to ten weeks to heal post-extraction. And if facings are to be used, you need about a three-month period of healing before you begin your prosthesis. After the phase one has been completed, you will make an impression for a new diagnostic cast. This is true especially if any kind of changes have been made to your existing teeth, uh, like crowns and restorations. You need to verify that your patient still has the qualifications for the design that you came up with. 
If there have been changes on the opposing arch, then it will require that you get a new diagnostic impression of the opposing arch also. You are going to use these new diagnostic casts to survey them and design them after all the restorations have been done. This will tell you whether or not the design needs further modification and it also will then tell you where your tooth modifications have to be after all these restorations have been completed. You're going to place the design on both of these casts. You can then analyze where you have high survey lines that do not allow you to place the components where they belong. Then you will go back to the mouth. You're going to make the necessary preparations on the teeth in order to, to make your design work well. You do not have to remount these casts because they may not be your master cast. You're going to analyze what changes you have to make on the teeth and you are getting ready for rest preparation and axial contours on your uh, patient. Now, this design may have been changed by the faculty member that you're now working with. This will be the final design. If they don't agree with the other one and they get you to this point where you're going to get ready to do rest preps, this you they have to feel comfortable working with the design you've come up with. If you and the instructor feel that this design now works, then place the final design on the upper part of the RPD step card on the arch forms. The design is not placed on the card until this point because there are changes that often take place while you're doing your restorative, endo, or perio procedures. After this, you are now ready to begin your axial contours and rest preparations on the teeth. You are asked to do a review with your instructor before beginning the rest preparations to make certain that you understand what needs to be done. If you have questions about prepping a certain tooth because of, say, an odd contour that it has, then prep it on the diagnostic cast and show it to your instructor first. My biggest fear is a student who is overly aggressive and really doesn't understand. Um, error on the light side because it doesn't require that a crown or a filling be done on the tooth because you um, overly aggressive. The dispensary should have an RPD burr block available with a collection of burrs that are ideal for making axial contours and rest preps. Remember that you, par that you prepare the parallel guide planes first and then the rest seats are completed. Make sure that any lingual and facial contours are altered if the uh, retainer arms or the reciprocal arms have to be placed too high up on the teeth. Complete all the rest preparations to fit the desired design. When doing an amalgam during the phase one, think about the one and a half millimeter reduction needed on the marginal ridge for the rest and the one or one and a half millimeter reduction in the fossa. When doing the restoration, you need to think about the amount of amalgam thickness placed into your tooth. After the rest prep has been completed, you must have sufficient thickness of amalgam left in the tooth to give strength enough to hold the partial framework. If the amalgam is too thin, it will crack and possibly some of it fall out. Plan your restoration accordingly. If a multiple surface amalgam is present, a casting may be a better choice of restoration for that tooth. If you're trying to check the amount of reduction on the tooth that you've just done, place some Vaseline on the prepared tooth surface and on the opposing arch. Then take a small piece of that red rope wax and run it, make it into a little ball and place it between the upper and lower arch and ask your patient to occlude. Have them close all the way, and then remove the wax and analyze your preparation by reading the thickness of the wax. If you can see through the wax in the area of that rest prep, or where the metal approaches the um, rest prep, then you probably don't have enough re reduction. So go ahead and make additional reduction 
do the same thing again. Uh, make sure that you're reading the proper placement on the uh, wax. Here's an example of what I was talking about. You can analyze, the, you can see the rest prep where the arrow is pointing. And you can analyze if you can actually see some light through that area right in that area then you don't have enough reduction. You can also take a perio probe and kind of stick it through that wax and see if you can analyze the thickness of the wax in the area of the rest prep. Continue checking with the red rope wax until the wax shows the proper reduction and you cannot see light through it in the areas where metal's going to cross. A very critical area of reduction uh, for rest preparations is where the um, clasp arms emerge between two teeth for embrasure clasp. Insufficient sluiceways in these areas will lead to fractured clasp arms. So make sure and read that with the red very carefully. When your rest preps are complete, you will make your final impressions. Usually you will use a stock metal tray with perforations for this impression. Do not use the blue disposable trays um, or any other disposable trays as alginate pulls away more easily even with the adhesive present. You do not have to use adhesive in the metal trays. They do not need it because they have so many retentive holes in them that you get plenty of retention. Adhesive makes a removal of the alginate material in the metal tray very difficult when another impression has to be made. It also leaves a real nasty sticky residue that is very hard for the people in sterilization to clean off before sterilizing the trays. Sometimes a custom tray is indicated. It is most likely used on the mandibular arch. It can be designed for either alginate or PBS. If you're using it for alginate, you should have plenty of good retentive holes in the tray for the alginate material. Do you see anything wrong with this tray? In my mind, it has a little uh, too few holes for retention of the impression material. This slide shows a maxillary custom tray. Do you remember the differences in the requirements for the handle on the maxillary and mandibular? On this maxillary, you'd like to have that tray mimic the angulation of the central incisors. The reason for this is so that when you pull down on the lip and border mold the anterior part of the tray, the handle does not get in the way. What about the amount of relief? If you remember on an alginate impression, you want to have at least a quarter inch thickness of alginate material, so it would require more re relief than the polyvinyl siloxane impression material, which requires about an eighth of an inch of thickness of material inside the tray. <clears throat> Regardless of the material that's used for that final impression, it should record all the vital anatomy. On the maxillary, the maxillary tuberosity, foveae palatini, and hamular notches should all be recorded in the impression. If you have trouble getting an impression in the stock tray, then evaluate first of all the fit of the tray. The fit of the impression tray is absolutely critical to the success of an impression. It should fit in the mouth with about a quarter of an inch space between the teeth and the impression tray. When you do not get the impression on repeated tries, then seek out a faculty member to help you. A custom tray may be required in order to complete this task. Um, pour and trim your cast, taking care to get the vestibular rolls and to have a little land area on the side of the cast. Do not eliminate critical anatomy or you will be back to making a new impression again. If this cast surveys well and the design is properly drawn, 
and you can have the components in the proper position, then this will be your final master cast. The same is true for the maxillary cast shown here, since this is an, a maxillary and mandibular RPD design. Place the master cast on the surveyor and look at the guide planes first. Then you're going to check the retention on the abutment teeth. If you have to change the guide plane position, do so slightly. And then if you have a dilemma, retention is the final determinant of the position of the cast. Place the survey lines on the cast. Next, be sure you tripod your cast and then draw the design on it. Use the diagnostic cast drawing as a guide to the correct positioning of Next, place the mandibular cast on the surveyor and look for your guide planes and retention. Determine the proper place, path of placement and then survey it, tripod it, and place your design on it. Let your instructor see your diagnostic cast that you drew on. It allows the instructor to kind of have a visual picture of how you interpreted the design when you first drew it. He can make some changes if necessary to tell you to maybe change the position of a component part that you have drawn on your first drawing when transferring it onto the master cast. Any case where you have an RPD over or under natural dentition, it must be mounted before the framework is made. Take the facebow registration to mount the maxillary cast. You should have already determined whether occlusion rims were needed to use to mount this case. Remember that a record base and occlusion rim made on another cast, like a diagnostic cast, cannot be used on master casts because the tissue makes a difference. You must uh, remake those occlusion rims. These rims are now going to be submitted to quality assurance and have to be approved before their use with the patient appointment. Record the centric relation and maximum or maximum intercuspation record. Allow the doctor to check it and then use that record to mount your lower cast. If the patient has a few remaining teeth that intercuspate in a repeatable occlusion, then the maximum intercuspation record position will be used at the patient's existing vertical dimension. If the patient has only 22 by 27 remaining, for example, the centric relation record will be recorded at the desired vertical dimension of occlusion. Get a prescription pad form from the dispensary and place the prescription instructions to your laboratory on a plain piece of paper first to show an instructor. When he approves what you have written, go ahead and place the prescription on the form Place a drawing of the RPDs in red on the arch forms at the top of the page. Next, obtain a cashier stamp on this form and then have your faculty member sign the prescription. It is then turned into the lab and will be sent to quality assurance. Things like your mounting, the um, uh, designs, and the rest preps will be checked before it's sent out to the laboratory to make a framework. The framework, when it comes back from the laboratory, will be inspected before you receive the case. The design will be checked against the framework. The fit of the framework will be evaluated and some other items. This is a mandibular framework and it appears to be workable. Quality Assurance will return it to you for a try-in. This maxillary framework has a couple of flaws. For example, the placement of the major connector into the hamular notches has not been achieved. It will work though because we can add acrylic all the way into those areas and have the proper extensions on this framework. We try the framework in the mouth. Some green occlude spray has been used to indicate pressure spots where it does not completely seat. The framework is adjusted in those areas where um, pressure is shown until the framework completely seats or a determination is made on whether it will have to be remade.
The fit of the framework is very much a factor of your impression and the handling of the gypsum products to produce a master cast. If it fits when it comes back from the laboratory, it should fit the mouth. The mandibular framework has been fitted and the occlusion adjusted to the mouth. It is then removed from the mouth and the maxillary framework is tried in and adjusted to the mouth. Each framework is tried in separately, fitted to the mouth, and the occlusion is adjusted on each one separately. The two frameworks are then inserted into the mouth and the occlusion is adjusted with both of them together in place. The occlusion with the frameworks in the mouth must match the occlusion with the frameworks out of the mouth and the teeth together. A high-speed handpiece and diamond burrs are used to make this adjustment. When the occlusion is correct, then the framework is polished with stones and rubber points. The partial denture design show, shown here has an extension base on one side, in other words, it's a class two. Therefore, it is indicated for an altered cast procedure in order to get a functional ridge form. This helps support that extension base better. It is done when the framework can be held in place in a three-finger tripod arrangement. It's also done for times when the original master cast did not extend into the proper uh, and capture the proper anatomy like the retromylohyoid fossa or the retromolar pads. The tray is constructed on the base attachment of the framework on the cast and then is adjusted in the mouth to just short of the depth of the vestibule. A thermoplastic material called border molding compound is added to the tray and manipulated in the mouth to cap capture the proper muscle movements in function. An impression is then made with the framework held in place in its terminal position with the open mouth technique. The fingers are kept on the framework, not on that extension base. The impression is then trimmed back to the internal finish line using a barred Parker blade in the red handled knife. This slide shows three different examples of ways to produce a final master cast with a functional impression of the edentulous area. The top left picture shows a bilateral extension base master impression being boxed. The master cast is adjusted so that the impression will fit onto the cast with absolutely no interference with the cast and the impression material. The cast is then boxed with red rope wax and boxing wax as shown in the lower left picture. The gypsum material is then poured into the impression to produce a cast. The bottom right is basically the same as the two shown on the left. It only has one extension base, so only one side is boxed. It's basically the boxing of the case that we saw in the two previous slides. The upper right picture shows another approach to making a master cast with a functional impression on the extension base side. This one calls for making the impression on the framework with a custom tray and then, in order to capture the rest of the teeth, rather than cut out an old cast, an impression in alginate is made over the other impression already in the mouth. The gypsum is then poured into this impression to produce a new cast. Here is a new altered cast shown on the right. Hopefully you can see the difference between the cast on the left, which was just an anatomic cast made with an alginate impression, and the one on the right where some viscous material pushes down on the ridges to form that functional cast. If the case was not mounted before you sent a framework to be made, or if you've done altered cast procedure, you will have to mount your case again. Occlusion rims are made on the new master cast. Occlusion rims made on diagnostic cast will not fit properly on another cast because the tissue recorded is different on every single cast. If you try to mount it with old 
uh, rims, you will get an inaccurate result. You can handle occlusion rims in one of two ways. One, you can make a new occlusion rim as shown below with some type of a triad or acrylic material. But I like the second method, which is to construct a wax occlusion rim on the framework base attachment. This framework is very stable because it has clasping on it and it remains in position in the mouth much better during the procedure of taking jaw registration records. So the new rims are used to record the face bow and obtain jaw registration records for mounting. Here is a mandibular rim shown here. You can use an occlusion rim made independently of the framework as shown in the top picture, or if the framework is utilized, it is made entirely of wax. Again, I utilize the framework because it adds such stability when I'm trying to make that jaw registration record. It's much superior. Here's an example of two frameworks that are utilized to retain the occlusion rims. Note also that there are some teeth set in the anterior on this particular case. Some people choose to have a little bit of a try-in of the anterior teeth at the time of occlusion rim placement. Rims are placed in the mouth and adjusted to the desired vertical dimension of occlusion. It's now ready for the jaw registration record to be made. A jaw registration record then is made of the patient at the position determined for your patient. A face bow transfer is taken using the maxillary occlusion rim if the upper cast is not already mounted on the patient. Teeth are now selected for the patient. Do you remember when this patient had their framework made, it had a facing on it. So the color of the facing had to be selected before the framework was sent off uh, and very possibly back at the time of diagnosis. The other teeth are selected and ordered. Before the case went out to the laboratory, a quality assurance was performed to make sure that the mounting looked reliable. Don't be surprised if you get it back an hour asked to make some changes before the case goes out to the laboratory. This case here is back for a try-in. This setup will be evaluated by QA again before you receive it. It is possible that it could be sent back to the laboratory prior to your receiving it if it is not satisfactory. Things like occlusion of the teeth, the position of the cusp, and whether the teeth are over the ridge are checked at QA and again in the mouth. Vertical dimension and phonetics are inspected at the trying appointment. Movement of the teeth is done, if necessary, by you if it is possible. Those posterior teeth are set a bit buckle at the cervical point. The cervical area of the teeth should have been adjusted and ground on before the setting. This was probably not caught in QA but it will be corrected when it's sent back. In this picture of an occlusal view of the maxillary arch, the teeth in the posterior are set a little on the buccal side. This should again be, have been caught by QA, but we'll need to make corrections. The mandibular teeth are shown here. The teeth appear to be set in the appropriate position, which is the middle groove over the crest of the ridge and in line as far as the crest of curvature with the remaining natural teeth. I think I would have liked to have seen another premolar set on that patient's right side. I think they're going to feel like they're slighted because there's a tooth missing in that area. 
The posterior tooth movement has been accomplished during the appointment, otherwise another try-in appointment would be necessary. If the anterior teeth are improperly placed at try-in, they should be set at the chair and not sent back to the laboratory with a prescription that says something like move the anteriors over 2 millimeters. This is unacceptable. It is highly likely that you will get them back in an improper position again. So you have to set those six anterior teeth at the chair if there's a problem. You can then have the laboratory reset the posterior teeth if necessary. The vertical dimension of occlusion and the CJR should also be checked before you reset or send these teeth back to the laboratory. The case has been sent out to the laboratory and processed. A quality assurance group looked at the uh, case before it went out to the lab and when it is returned we'll look at it again to make sure the processing has been done adequately. It is then time for you to deliver the denture to the patient. You will place pressure indicator paste on the inside of the denture and try it in the mouth very gently. Any pressure spots will be removed before the patient is released. On an RPD over RPD, a CD over RPD, or any natural dentition opposing an RPD or a CD, you will have to adjust the occlusion in the mouth. The reason we remount a CD over CD is because of the movement of the lower CD while attempting to do an adjustment. You do not have to do that with an RPD. It is being held in place with class. Here is the final case in the mouth after the occlusions adjusted and we have administered oral hygiene information to the patient. The patient is now ready to be released and adjustment appointments to be scheduled. We will schedule a 24 or 48 hour appointment for the patient because he will have some sore spots. And then at that point we'll have another appointment about four days later and then weekly adjustments as needed until the patient is lesion free. Credit is given for a case when the patient is lesion free and there has been a minimum of two weeks that have expired between the patient delivery and your last appointment.